Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to RettSyndrome.org's Town Hall with Montefiore's Tri-State Rett Clinic, located in the Bronx in New York City. Before we begin, I'd like to share some quick tips on how GoToWebinar operates as if this is your first time joining us. Attendees, um, sorry, attendees are automatically on mute. The audio is open to our presenters only, so you don't have to worry about your background noise interfering with the presentation. Your webcam is also turned off, so you can feel free to curl up on your couch with your favorite people, your favorite beverage, watch, listen, and learn. If you look to the upper right corner of your screen, you will see a control panel window. We invite you to type your questions or comments in the question field throughout the presentation, and we will answer these at the end of the talk. In addition, we will address all of the questions that you submitted um, at the time of registration, and they were some really good ones, so thank you for sending those in. If the control panel window is distracting to you, you can minimize or drag the uh, window down to the bottom of your screen, and then you can expand it at any time if you wish to submit a question. Next point is this session is being recorded. Uh, you can, uh, you'll receive a link to the recording in the next day or two. So if you want to revisit any of the information presented today or share with a family member or someone on your child's care team who would benefit from this information, please feel free to share that link. If you're having trouble hearing, please check your device. If your Wi-Fi slows down, sometimes just logging out of the app and logging back in will, um, will take care of those troubles. Okay, I hope everyone is seeing my screen. So if you joined us today for the Montefiore Tri-State Rec Clinic with Dr. Sasha Jukic, you've arrived at the right place. This is Paige Nuez. I'm your Director of Family Empowerment with RettSyndrome.org. And all of us at the International Rett Syndrome Foundation want to thank you for being with us today and for your support and engagement. While we were disappointed to move our online or in-person events online this year, um, we are very happy to be able to meet virtually to bring you up to date on current activities and this affords us an opportunity to meet with those new or unable to travel. Uh, and you can meet us and learn more about us. So thanks for being with us today. So much good progress has happened despite 2020's disruptions and you des deserve to learn about them. Your very contributions to fundraisers, family to family support, um, and research participation has enabled this great work to happen. Your continued support through virtual galas, strollathons, Giving Tuesday, and especially your tremendous activity to raise awareness during October Rett Syndrome Awareness Month and beyond, uh, really demonstrate how mighty and committed you are to your loved one and our ongoing work. So despite the disruptions and hiccups, we have not given up on you or your family, and, um, and we haven't lost sight of your needs. So a warm welcome and thank you to all of you who are new and those who are familiar. I see a lot of familiar names out there. Thanks for being with us today. We hope to lift you up and answer some questions that are on your minds. So we believe that the information on our rare disorder should be free to all who avail themselves of it. And we thank our supporters for that shared belief. Our sponsored Ed Days, Town Halls, Red Ed webcasts are all possible and thanks to Acadia Pharmaceuticals, Greenwich Biosciences, and Neuron Pharmaceuticals. And what that allows us to do is dedicate all of your donor dollars to our ongoing research programs. So thank you to our sponsors. As we find ourselves at the crossroads of many issues competing for our attention and resources, we must recenter and refocus our attention on this Rett syndrome road that is so personal to us. We were cast upon it with our children, not because of anything we did or didn't do, but it is a difficult road nonetheless, made even more difficult if we are lonely and we travel it alone without help or hope. 
So we at RettSyndrome.org and the team at Montefiore are here for your help and to deliver hope. Rett syndrome knows no boundaries. It affects one in 10,000 females worldwide and even more rarely in males. Most have never heard of it and no parent wishes for it. However, the bright and engaging eyes and smiles of our mostly nonverbal children do envelop our hearts and minds with purpose and move us to find strength we never thought possible. All of us at the foundation, our board of directors, our virtual team across the United States, our League of Parent Volunteers are committed in partnership with you to offer connection, education, and advocacy for all affected with Rett syndrome while we invest and advocate for research progress. And I say that both as your director of family empowerment at the foundation, as well as mom to a really beautiful teenager with Rett syndrome. Before I share our agenda, I wanna share a quote from a parent that re really resonates with me and I hope will resonate with you too as a guiding star to the healthiest work that we can do as we hold on to hope for our best days ahead. So here's what a parent said to once. Today marks two years since we found out A has Rett syndrome. Before she was diagnosed, I worried about why she can't do this. When we got the diagnosis, it was, she won't be able to do this. And now I try to focus on figuring out how she can do this. I'm so proud of her for all that she has and continues to accomplish. And while I still have moments of sadness and worry about what the future will bring, I'm going to ground myself in the present because it's a good place to be. I feel like at this moment in time, again, with so many pressures going on in the world, no truer words have been spoken about the importance of grounding ourselves in the present, understanding the status of research, understanding all of the potential that our children have to grow and thrive and develop, to not be stuck with those scary words of regression, but really understand that we have many resources, many experts working on our behalf to help our children and ourselves be healthy and succeed. So with that in mind, let's talk about what we can do to help you and your family. For our agenda today, we are gonna first meet with Dr. Sasha Jukic from Montefiore Children's Hospital Tri-State Rett Syndrome Clinic. Then we're gonna hear some updates from rettsyndrome.org, and then we're going to move to Q&A. We have a lot to cover today. We're gonna to do our best to stick to 90 minutes, but if you, um, have a lot of questions, we can stay on longer. If we run out of time and we still have questions in the queue, we will get to them through a QA document. And again, the session is being recorded. So if you have to leave and take care of something in your home or wherever you are, that's fine. You'll get a link to the recording. So it's been our honor to partner with Dr. Ajukic for so many years now for referrals, knowledgeable and compassionate clinical care through clinical trials, research panels, and many working groups. She knows about Rett syndrome and she cares about you. If you happen to be her patient, you know this to be true. So it's with deep gratitude that we especially thank Dr. Jukic and the entire team of healthcare and essential workers at Montefiore for your dedication. We know it's been a very long year for you. We know that the marathon is long, but we know the rewards are great and there are wins to be had if we keep our eyes on the finish line and we continue to support each other and work together. Thank you for all of your work. Thank you for being with us today on this Saturday. We know we'll get there thanks to you. So what I'd like to do now is turn the stage over to Dr. Juke. Hello. Uh, let her uh, give us some updates. Okay, so I'm going to share, share the same. Uh, it is wonderful to be with you, and I'm really honored uh, by this opportunity because we have all been working remotely, and it is a huge joy for me to speak with you, to learn from you, and just to spend time together. But before I start talking, um, I have to share with you that two weeks ago, we suddenly lost one of our own, Dr. Mary Jones. 
Mary was the founding member of the Katie's Clinic for the Red Syndrome at the Children's Hospital in Auckland and its director since 28. Uh, when I think of Mary, it is with my highest respect and with my warmest feelings, with her deep compassion and heartfelt empathy, she touched and fundamentally helped many people in many ways. As a scientist, she always motivated me to be better and to do more. She led by example, by always diving into the issues she was researching deeply, by sharing her knowledge selflessly, by understanding better, better than any other of us that physicians the need to educate pediatricians. She loved our red children the way she loved her own children. Our meeting today led by her favorite person, Paige, where we have come together to support each other, to learn from each other, and to have the joy of being together is exactly the kind of atmosphere Mary would cherish the most. Uh, in that spirit, and to celebrate her life, let's have a good meeting and let's have a positive attitude. So, uh, Paige asked me to speak about uh, a red clinic, and I know I know that uh, many of you are my patients, and many of you are not my patients. You attend other clinics, clinics, and many of you have never been seen by the red doctor. So, I apologies. I, I, I will try to uh, speak uh, about facts which may be useful for all, all of you. So, my name is Sasha Djokic. I'm director of the Tri State Red Syndrome Center since its opening in January 2008. Okay, Paige, so now my slides are not. Uh -huh. Our mission is really to treat patients, to educate parents and therapists and to perform research in order to develop better treatments and to understand better fundamentals of disease. So we do the best we can do today, but we, have, we, we are looking in the future and hope to do better in the future. Uh, the centers were born in January of 2008, literally out of the optimism brought by scientific, scientific proof that even most severe symptoms can be reversed. Um, I read the article in February and I spoke promptly with my chairman and said, like, I really want to organize uh, the Red Center because I believe these girls can be cured and I want to keep them in the best uh, possible shape until that day comes. It took six months to prepare everything and we saw our first patient in January. So the core of our philosophy is our conviction that these experimental results will translate into successful treatments. Uh, our main clinical efforts are focused on providing multidisciplinary care uh, with the aim of helping the entire family because they really believe in the family, the child does better than the family does better. So you really, parents need to understand what is happening in their daughter's brains. Uh, they know what are weaknesses and what are strengths. And then at that moment, we can get on board together and plan each step in order to achieve our long-term goal. We promote education and also to minimize the need for transportation, all consultations are performed uh, at the same location. Uh, our we have a large team of physicians and how we operate is that we do not have cardi cardiology team. One of the cardiologists sees the patient. We have one cardiologist, one geneticist, pulmonary, gastroenterology. We have uh, 15, uh, 14 specialists. Within neurology, uh, we have somebody who is a neurologist, epileptologist and movement disorder specialist. Um, I'm not going to read all of that, but we are making joint effort to make our girls have the best possible ride. Uh, our clinic coordinator has always been red mom because nobody better understands uh, our needs 
than the rat mom. Uh, our patient population is uh, basically, we have 360 uh, uh, patients, boys and girls. Uh, the youngest patient is currently eight months old and the oldest 74 years old. Um, basically, we communicate with patients by direct line. We have a dedicated line, so you don't have to be on long hold, and uh, uh, by email. Uh, we have clinic every Friday. So uh, our patients come from 30 of the states within the United States, from Asia, from Europe, and from South America. Uh, basically, a clinic is supported uh, every, every single project. I, I, my biggest pride uh, so far uh, has been uh, develop, uh, uh, um, provide uh, uh, the fact that uh, we pro my team provided the proof that our girls can learn, that they have uh, cognitive abilities, which had been doubted before. And every single project aim to explore intellect, intellectual potential has been funded by RSO. I cannot be more grateful. Uh, we also re receive annual financial support uh, from RSRT, uh, which enable us to fund part-time uh, clinic coordinator. Uh, we received uh, also funding a pr proportion of their uh, gala event from New Jersey Red Syndrome Association, which goes towards funding our communication specialist. Uh, research is funded by RSO, NIH, and Red Syndrome Research Trust, and we have uh, a, a value uh, support from our individual families who can support us in any way they can, and you have been very generous, which helps us operate. Uh, so, COVID has changed the life of the clinic and has changed your lives and my own also. Uh, we switched to televisits and there are positive things about televisits because in the emergency we can see each other promptly. Uh, for follow-up patients uh, who I know well, uh, they don't need to travel for patients who, tra who, who, so it is much, you don't have to take a day off. So it is much easier. And we know that telehealth is here to stay. Uh, for new patients, um, depending on the pandemic, oops, depending on, upon the st status of the pandemic, they can either um, uh, see us in person or by televisit. So uh, something which you need to understand, I don't know how, to, I don't want to go back, I advanced slide by mistake, but uh, I will explain. Basically, um, the problem is now seeing telepatients across the state borders. Uh, because uh, we are all licensed in our own, own states and it is illegal to practice medicine, meaning televisits is uh, practicing medicine in another state if you don't live in New York state for, for appointments with me and with our specialists. During the uh, pandemic, many governors have lifted those restrictions. So there is a website which keeps uh, uh, being updated every week, where we can see whether the government from uh, governor from your state lifted restriction or, and whether we, during the certain time, can have a video visit. So if somebody asks for the visit, we have to check and it may be possible or not. The second fact is that when I speak with my patients from Pennsylvania, from Texas, uh, basically uh, they check and they say, but my insurance approves. It has nothing to do with the insurance because it is not about payment. It is about uh, uh, legality and we can lose our licenses. And for the international patient, it is illegal. We have restrictions, at least in my hospital, we cannot see international uh, patients in televisits at all. So that is about the organization of the clinic. To make the appointment, you can just email and the email is erect at montefiori.org and we'll start from there. So um, I, uh, in March, when uh, COVID was really raging in New York, uh, 
we were all overwhelmed. And although I'm a pediatric neurologist and I last listened to the person's heart, adult person's heart in medical school, I, 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 had, I was deployed and I was running COVID floor. So I saw the ugly face of the disease firsthand and I hope I can forget it. So we need to stay careful. And now I will go through, Paige asked me to go over some recommendations. Basically, protect, I was uh, uh, holding patients, uh, turning them, uh, dialing phones and call, uh, in order to allow them to speak with the uh, uh, families. And the entire floor was every room, they're only the most severe COVID patients. I did not get it just because of the simple like uh, masks, shields, and uh, gloves. So, uh, Bird Health Organization endorsed the use of face covering for children two years and older, and American Academy of Pediatrics agrees that is the recommendation. So, younger than two, no, but two and older. They also said that uh, cloth face coverings are similar to surgical masks. Uh, face shields are much more effective, and they're different face shields. This one, which is standard, there is this one, which some girls actually tolerate be better, which is a comfortable necklace and goes from down. So they really cannot put their hands in the mouth and they're these like, uh, like hats. Uh, we know that we need to hand wash, but uh, uh, for our children uh, with red syndrome, uh, maybe, uh, it may be more effective if they have limited mobility to sanitize surfaces and then they can touch, but we know that the surfaces are clean and physical distances, distancing. Um, I have been asked uh, many, many times, I have 360 patients and probably have been asked more than 200 times uh, what to do with return to school. So that is in terms of COVID, uh, those girls who do not walk independently, it is easier to return them to school. Uh, I insist that each patient has full-time one-to-one to keep them distance, especially if there are other children who are ambulatory in the class who can reach out to them. And um, it is important to assess uh, parental risk of exposure at work. So it is not only whether the child goes to work, but uh, their parents were teachers. So I have written letters asking for uh, asking uh, uh, advocating for those parents to work to be allowed from work home. And so far we have been successful. Uh, something which I cannot emphasize uh, emphasize enough is that we have to worry about super spreaders. We know much better about this disease today than we did uh, back in the spring. So sick patients rarely transmit the disease. Uh, you become sick about six to seven days after your, the infection and you are most, uh, uh, most um, uh, contagious a few days before you become sick. And most people, they are carriers of the virus, so they spread it, but they have no symptoms, they're healthy. So be, feeling well does not mean that, we can, that, that that person cannot spread the disease. Uh, in terms of uh, patients are hesitant to come to the hospital, uh, hospitals have seen the ugly side of disease and hospitals are now safe because measures are really rigorous. Uh, so I do feel safer in the hospital than when I go to the supermarket. So if you need to make in-person visit, uh, it is probably fine. And I assume that it is the same in all bigger academic centers. Uh, in terms of treatments, they're good news and they're coming rapidly. Monoclonal antibodies, that is one of the treatments that the president uh, received. Is FDA, uh, it has been approved, two monoclonal antibodies have been approved by uh, FDA for uh, 12 years and older. Uh, but there is a compassionate use and we would be able to use it for younger children. Uh, basically, this is only for patients who are not hospitalized. Not, that we don't use them when patients get very sick. Uh, but they prevent disease progression 
uh, need for hospitalization and actually reduces the viral load in the body. So what they do, they actually, they're laboratory made proteins, they're not from uh, uh, protoplasm from people who had uh, COVID. They mimic the immune system's ability to fight off viruses, like when you get a shot, you, so this is the imitation of that. They're specifically directed against the spike protein of the COVID virus. Uh, actually, they block the virus's attachment uh, and entry into the human cell. We know that the nose is one of the most uh, uh, important points of entry because it has some receptors. So basically, uh, this monoclonal antibodies block, uh, block virus. Once you get them, uh, you're positive, and at least today. So you're going to have some virus in your body. But in order for more virus to get into your body, this um, uh, monoclonal antibodies are effective. Once the virus gets in the body, we have remedis, uh, remdesivir medication, which actually uh, is also approved for patients 12 years so, uh, and older, but FDI approved emergency use for pediatric patients weighing 3.5 kilograms, which is 7.7 .7 pounds, which most of our girls will qualify. So that is something we are in a better position than uh, uh, we were before, and this is for sick patients, for patients who are in the hospital. So uh, this medication, actually, we can just focus on this last, uh, prevents virus from multiplying. So the virus is in, in the body, uh, monoclonal antibodies are blocking more coming in the system from our membranes, uh, but that virus, which is already in the body, cannot uh, replicate uh, uh, if we uh, receive this medication, so it looks better. Uh, vaccines are on their way. I have received uh, information today that FDA will approve the first Pfizer vaccine uh, uh, within 10 days. Uh, the second will, Modern, or not, will come soon, and then, then three other all high quality vaccines. So basically, advice uh, in the time of COVID first, don't forget, it will get worse before it gets better but there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, the end of this frightening journey is in sight. So by the spring, we should be, we should be better. We have to be uh, very vigilant and patient to support each other until, uh, uh, I think that everybody predicts January, February, December are going to be worse, but then uh, it will be uh, over more or less. So now back to the clinic. Uh, we will talk about uh, our uh, research. Uh, basically, when we talk about research, all research is uh, uh, focused on treatment targets. What are treatment targets? The ultimate treatment targets is a gene and gene functions protein. Uh, clinicians uh, cannot experiment directly with the gene. That is something which is in the hands of scientists who experiment with animals. And then pharma, who, because of humanistic and professional business interests, financial interests, wants to, to promote it. So we work very actively with different companies, with basic scientists and with pharma, uh, letting them know, because they really do not know what is important to patients. Uh, they, uh, how I see our job, we have first to see whether the product they're offering, uh, there is any reasonable logic that it can help. And then safety, safety and safety. Like we have to be a barrier, maybe uh, many companies approach because that's in there is much bigger vis visibility. And I have to say, I personally, uh, 90% of them, I never have a second conversation with them because it is not serious enough. The medication worsens tremor, worsens seizures, and uh, we have to protect you. So they, we can have more trials, but we have to be selective. 
effective because we, 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 we have time uh, to get better. And then, uh, we, uh, not, uh, not, uh, besides advising scientists and advising uh, pharma, we need to have with our own uh, infrastructure readiness for trials. We have to have like uh, 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 patients ready, we have to have our methodology ready, and that is what like the France we, we work on. In terms of clinical, uh, a clinical treatment target, something that we can do today, uh, we address weaknesses with standard treatments, epileptic anti epileptic medications to, for seizures, etc., and novel approaches. Uh, we are a tight community, we communicate among each other, I mean red centers and red, red doctors, and there are many medications which we use off-label, which are helpful. For instance, we use Lexapro for breathing, and they don't want to spend more time. And novel approaches, we are able to offer uh, trials, which are uh, reasonable. Uh, our mission, uh, each of us, uh, myself, each of you, we have our strengths and we all have our weaknesses. And like us, our children with Rett syndrome, they have their weaknesses, which everybody can see, but they have their strengths. And our, I see as our mission to actually work, help their strengths become more visible and grow. So it is not only address symptoms and difficulties, help and advocate for something they can do, and they can do many things. So uh, we, because we have uh, 15 doctors and we have been seeing patients for more than 10 years, it allows us to summarize our experience and we uh, published a lot in hopes to help families and physicians who do not have so much experience with Rett syndrome. Uh, the motive was to extend knowledge uh, and treatments and to co contribute to this disease understanding and management. And I will just give you a few uh, examples. Uh, for instance, uh, we published recently a paper about autonomic functions in cardiology. We know that uh, we all worry about prolonged QTC, ca ca cardiac arrhythmia, uh, we, uh, we all know that from time to time we have to have EKG. And basically what we found that patients with um, 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 158M, T158M mutation are more frequent, more uh, likely to have prolonged QTC. That patients who use medications which are broadly used, SSRIs, Lexapro, Trazodone, are more likely to, uh, tra to transition to abnormal prolonged QTC, and patients with more severe breathing. So those groups of patients we need to uh, we need to evaluate more frequently. And by providing uh, uh, this literature, uh, patients who do not have access to Red Center can bring the paper to their uh, physicians and uh, hopefully get better care. Uh, we published two pap uh, papers on this page as following and uh, discovered actually the unique one is in children one to five, one is in older and teenagers, and actually found and described a uh, unique finding of the tongue movement. We presented this find, uh, we presented these uh, findings on many conferences uh, with the specialists for uh, uh, swallow specialists. And they were all surprised, they haven't seen. It seems to be, I don't, I don't know whether it is unique to rat, but it is rarely seen in other diseases. And that is the tongue movement. So when we close our, this is fluoroscopy, there are some segments from the fluoroscopy. So when you close, when we close the mouth, this is the tongue. Tongue goes up and backwards. And then ports during the oops, then ports even more backwards during the uh, during the swallowing process, and sometimes comes completely in the our throat. So we gag, and sometimes it brings the food, a uh, 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 bolus of food, and pushes it directly into the airways. So knowing that is very important. So because when you have a swallow study, many uh, uh, usually. A uh, person who does a swallow study, it is an X-ray, and you have just a small amount, a limited amount of time of exposure of X-ray. Many people focus on the stomach, 
because they think there is a reflux. So it is important to show these articles to person who is doing because they have to the problem with us here in the upper airways and, and mouth. Uh, uh, I again advanced slide by mistake. Uh, so scoliosis management, we found that patients with red syndrome undergoing scoliosis surgery have higher rates of respiratory failure and longer ventilation times. Meaning when somebody has a scoliosis surgery, usually doctors try to extubate the same day. We like to keep our dose uh, intubated one day longer and then the post-operative course is smoother. So that is also something which is published and which can be shared by, by surgeons who are not familiar with that. Uh, our most extensive research efforts are aimed towards defining cognitive phenotype in order to end the perception that those with red syndrome cannot learn, to confront skeptics, and to indicate effective remediation strategies. So cognitively, we have strengths, but we have to learn about specifics of the weaknesses so we can uh, plan treatments to overcome those weaknesses. So when we came on the scene, this was the mindset uh, about the cognitive abilities of our children. Uh, it is unclear whether the cognitive level of development is sufficient to permit any meaningful skill learning. Results indicate that islands of motor intellectual functions persist in red patients. Majority of patients did not demonstrate a level of functioning higher than nine months of age. That is not true, but these are like the leading articles from the literature from 10 years ago. Then the fixed looks of these children do not necessarily signify indication of positive cognitive capacity. That was uh, uh, depressing. We all who had personal contact with patients with red syndrome knew that that was not true, but we didn't have any evidence to confront the skeptics and mostly those skeptics uh, uh, for our therapists and teachers. So what we do, I apologize to my patients, these are eyes, beautiful eyes of my patients. I apologize to them, they know this, but I think it is important to share for people who do not have experience attending the red clinic. So basically the question is, my PhD is in neuropsychology, so I was really drawn to girls with red syndrome uh, because I saw that the clarity in their eyes. So the question said, what do they see? Because if you just look, it does not mean that you see something. What do they look at? And can their eyes be window in the context of their mind? Since then, we conducted many, uh, many uh, studies and published more than 15 papers just to demonstrate basically what we do. We show slides and then look where in the slide uh, uh, the, uh, our page participants uh, look. So we, I combined six different pictures, but it looks like one picture. And if you don't know what you're looking, you're just going to look randomly. If you understand, then you're going to look at each picture separately. And basically these are healthy children, these are red girls. And red girls completely saw, saw each picture as individually and here actually distinguished a girl between the horse. So they see, uh, see in the, way, the same way the healthy children uh, do. Uh, we showed them the slide of a giraffe, and this is showing where they look downstairs. The more red, the longer they look. Of course, they are in wheelchairs, they have seizures, they have heavy breathing, but they're very attentive, and they look where the action is. They're looking at the giraffe. The next slide, we show, we show the giraffe, but we show two new uh, uh, cartoons in the corners, and look what happens. Very promptly, within less than a second, the gaze shifts from the main target to the new target, which is because you already know that. Uh, we show different cartoons, and of course, they're not interested in empty squares. They all look at the cartoon. Then the next slide, <coughs> we change quickly the slide. We move the cartoon down and look, this is where the gaze happens, the gaze moves to the cartoon. Uh, this, is, this is the same uh, uh, slide. So we show them, we also show, so basically they're very specific, they know what they see, they have specific preferences and they have good uh, visual attention and they have good visual discrimination. So they understand context of these uh, pictures. 
something at that time they were still they were still uh, uh, cl classified as autistic. What we show that they have exquisite preference to a uh, socially weighted stimuli. If you show them objects and people, they're going to always look at people. They're people oriented. That is opposite from children who are autistic. And this was really important to argue and for classification in schools because if you are in the classroom with children who are autistic, your child is going to, who wants to communicate but cannot. <coughs> will model uh, after autistic children who do not have need to communicate or if you are you have to be classified appropriately and having uh, published scientific evidence helps with that uh, so uh, once we completed these baseline studies we uh, uh, we basically built a team of child neuropsychologists and systematically uh, in systematic fashion studied further attention memory learning and show they can learn they need more repetitions uh, and and uh, they can remember so these are all the articles that we have published we don't have to uh, we also found uh, some problems, uh, identified issues which need to be addressed. For instance, uh, not only that uh, our children have exquisite preference to look at, at uh, socially weighted stimulus at people, but they look at people's eyes. So the problem is when they focus on something, uh, they have problems shifting attention. And if you uh, your uh, uh, child has Toby eye tracker. You know that they sometimes they look at one icon and keep repeating. That, and we have to work on that shifting attention. Due to that reason, uh, they sometimes have problem uh, identifying emotions because they spend most of the time looking only at eyes. But they spend less than 1% of time looking at nose and mouth. So. Uh, a therapist from our, our center, they know that, and you really, that is something we have to teach them. We have to gesticulate more, maybe put more prominent makeup, and just teach them to, to, to screen uh, uh, the, the entire uh, picture. Uh, our research, our uh, spe communication specialist, uh, basically has now a therapy dog who is pushing button and talks with girls. She asks them, how old are you? She replies, I'm eight months old. And that is engaging for young girls who are just starting. And she actually uh, is a private speech therapist. This was paid by the Board of Education. Uh, and she goes to homes and uh, of, of several of our patients. This is a very uh, brief clip. She comes very early in the morning, a uh, session with Maria. And this is what Maria tells her. Going to bed. Something's wrong. Tired. You're tired? <laughs> You're tired. I know mommy woke you up early from your nap. Go back. Go back to page one. Turn, Turn the page. page. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry mommy I'm woke sorry. you up early. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm kidding. Oh, just so, so basically so she joke. made the joke that she said she was looking forward and we want to hear jokes from them and laughter. Uh, so uh, with that, I don't want to spend more time on the clinical research because I know that you mostly are interested in treatment trials. So uh, basically, uh, we should not be naive about, I'm very optimistic, I'm the optimist, and I approach uh, this field, which is my field, with the same optimism uh, I did 10 years ago. But you have to, uh, every trial is not a cure. So we do trials to answer questions which we do not know. We do not know if the drug is safe. We don't know whether it will help. We do not know the dose, how much we have to give. We don't know for how long do we have to treat. Is it five days? Is it five weeks or five months? And we 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 have to think about quality of. We have to have well designed trials. So when you participate, you actually help answer all these questions. Uh, we completed two treatment trials. Uh, one was uh, because we are a large center, we have many patients and it is much easier within a year, we can recruit patients and finish 
so in multi-center trials, it lasts for a long time. So we did these two trials on our own. The first one is pharmacological treatment with lutiramyl acetate, which is a drug which is used for multiple sclerosis. We published uh, the article. And the second is a pharmacological treatment with lovastatin. The first uh, uh, trial uh, had uh, uh, I uh, exceptionally good results uh, because the drug is expensive it is about four thousand uh, for person for a month we were not able to get funding for further larger scale trials but I will show videos in the next slide the second it is important to know the second trial did not work we gave the right dose first we have evidence it is about lovastatin uh, about cholesterol mechanism uh, uh, metabolism we uh, know from uh, the work of monica justice that mice has abnormal cholesterol metabolism we worked together with her and did the same test in our girls as she did in mice and we found the same profile every second girl younger than 10 has abnormal cholesterol and lipid metabolism so it was something so then she did uh, um, she did the experiments in animal model with treatment for, of uh, with the medication which lowers cholesterol they started to have better balance they started to run better breathing improved uh, uh, we uh, did the trial we treated long enough we gave the uh, dose uh, to maximal tolerability and the trial did not work so the lesson is if things work in mice they don't always work so we have to uh, when we start we have to be ready for that to avoid disappointments but more trials are coming so this is now this trial which did work this is alex uh, she's a wonderful patient who is higher fun. She walks and talks. This is before the trial. She walks, but because of the severe dystonia, her legs get stiff. Her, her parents are actually using the stroller all the time. So this is before the trial. Yeah. Yeah. You have surgery. It might be the girl. Hey, Alex, take a few steps away and come back. So she cannot walk. This is after like uh, 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 three months on trial. Sorry. No, sorry. That's right. You're Alex walking seriously like normal. Getting so that was that was the most effective trial I had been uh, uh, work working on. Okay, uh, trials which are currently, uh, which we have currently are open, uh, are ketamine. It is a phase two double blind crossover trial, four week trial uh, with two five day uh, treatment days. Uh, inclusion criteria, children six to 12 years old, females with genetically confirmed typical or atypical red syndrome who have not achieved uh, a manner. Exclusion criteria are certain medications, which unfortunately many of our girls are those medications. Uh, basically, uh, this idea that uh, ketamine can help uh, came from the lab of David Katz, who tested in animal model, and he basically showed that the anterior parts of the brain, who, uh, parts which are responsible for our cognition, are hypofunctional. And posterior parts of the brain, brain stem, which is uh, responsible for breathing and autonomic functions, is, is hyperfunctional. So, uh, ketamine is NMDA receptor antagonist and it balances actually the networks. Uh, there is uh, basically a story of a single anecdotal story about a Scottish patient. Uh, who was treated for seizures for five days or with oral ketamine and who demonstrated improvement in seizures, motor function, communication and cognition. Uh, the treatment was stopped after eight weeks, she got worse, the treatment was restarted and then she got better. We have to be skeptical about individual uh, uh, cases, anecdotal evidence, but in this case we do have a strong scientific evidence. 
basically uh, most dramatically function with approved most dramatically is breathing but uh, other functions improved too the second trial we're starting to recruit uh, within a few weeks uh, it was actually everything was ready then because of covid we had our dean and many deans actually uh, stopped uh, it was not ethical to bring uh, children for treatment trials and now uh, we restarted again after a lot of administrative hurdles so it is uh, there uh, uh, it is uh, trifenidate is a N terminal peptide cleavage product of igf1 uh, there were two previous uh, phase two trials one in patients 16 to 45 and one in patients 5 to 15. so overall it demonstrated much better efficacy they they claim these are quotes from the literal quotes from the paper so basically they demonstrated efficacy in both groups much better in younger groups and the higher dose uh, many of my patients asked me what improved and that's not such an easy question for me to answer because what was the question is what was measured and measured were composite scores retinal behavior questionnaire uh, cgi improvement so basically uh, this is a composite of uh, how does she breathe does she get anxious how does she sleep so those scores uh, improved so you have to be aware what is this is not a cure the magnitude effect meaning percent of change of the median score is 5 to 15 percent in patients who were treated with trifinidate versus 5 to 6 of placebo so basically the improvement is about 10 percent uh, current trial is a phase 3 which is a definitive trial if it proves uh, to be efficient uh, the fda we hope that the fda will approve the medication this double blind a uh, blind placebo trial which will last 12 weeks inclusion criteria 5 to 20 years female patients with typical red syndrome but all those patients who continue uh, this treatment will have open label extension initially it was 40 weeks and now the company is telling us because they hope that the drug will be approved uh, the, they will provide free of charge treatment for all participants until uh, the drug is approved uh, we completed we recruited 10 patients in the cannabis trial double blind study but that trial is has been closed for a fi a business financial purposes by the company and we still do not know the results so i will close soon uh, basically in order to uh, do trials to have better quality of trials we have to have good measures what are you measuring as you saw all these trials we were talking about we have impression question is do parents feel that they are better do i as the physician and we are all biased so biomarker is an uh, objective measure which correlates with the patient status and which is sensitive to change meaning if the biomarker change uh, it is a strong prediction that the patient will change or the symptom will change so uh, definition of nih objectively measured evaluated indicator of normal biological processes pathogenic processes pharmacologic responses to intervention sensitive to change we worked in our center we worked with scientists and were published data basically this is a translation research on uh, uh, developing by bi uh, metabolic biomarkers immunological biomarkers and neurophysiological signatures these are like signatures of disease and now we are working on the study of genetic biomarkers example of physiological signatures is that we put this cap on the head and the patient is listening to sounds words and non-words for instance if you say words words which are uh, meaningful and then once you say a non-word brain waves if you understand it brain waves are going to have the uh, show show that you understand it so you don't have to cooperate it is objective and you have these waves so if you have this wave if you give the medication if you see this peak goes up it means that the the, the, the brain is engaged this drug is doing something positive to the brain so that is the illustration of biomarker and we publish papers but i'm not going to go to that the study biomarker study which is open and which i'm optimistic about is a, a study of microRNAs. 
micro RNAs are small, non-coding RNA mo molecules. They just have 22 nucleotides that functions uh, in RNA silencing and, uh, and gene expression. So they actually completely are base pairs of the uh, uh, active uh, M uh, messenger RNA in the brain, but they float in the blood. They're so small, they float in the blood. So they're small segments of which match regular uh, uh, RNA. In animal model, they matched uh, well in, uh, uh, they matched well disease uh, severity, and we've completed the preliminary study in 30 uh, patients with red syndrome and 30 controls and published results. And basically what we found that just if you look at the blood and you do not know who has red, who does not, Propels are distinctly different in red children to compare to healthy children. And there is a strong correlation uh, 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 in between these biomarkers and disease severity. So we are now having NIH sponsoring. So we patients who come to clinic will be asked, we will ask you to participate. It is a blood draw uh, in hopes to develop biomarker, which will be effective measure for future. In addition to all these activities, we are very active in our uh, uh, national and international networks and publish, contribute our data and publish together with them. Uh, so now to close, uh, basically uh, this is my speech from the first Blue Sky Girls event. Um, before, uh, so, uh, uh, before I asked the girls to start climbing the stairs, like this is what I said. Climbing space is a symbolic gesture because climbing takes you upward and forward, no matter how difficult it may be. Uh, today, uh, ten years later, uh, we have moved, moved forward much uh, on our journey, and I'm convinced that the blue sky is much closer to our reach than it was 10 years ago. Thank you. Paige, this is my last slide. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, I'm gonna turn my webcam back on. What a wonderful presentation. We are so impressed with the amount of projects you run at your clinic, the number of patients that you see, your compassion, I am, uh, in love with Blue Sky Girls event. And thank you for closing with that video. Thank you. Thank you. We have, um, we have about 10 minutes of updates from rettsyndrome.org, and then we'd love to get to the question queue. So if you don't mind, I'm going to take back over the screen here, let you rest, have a drink of water, and then we'll invite you to come back to talk to some questions. Again, everybody, we are recording today's session, so you'll have a chance to go back and revisit all of those wonderful projects and look up the papers that Dr. Juke talked about. All right. Um, our Chief Science Officer, Dr. Dominique Prashard, cannot be with us today, but she did record a message for you. I'm going to go ahead and play this now, and I hope that you have a chance to meet her and know her. She's a wonderful addition to our team. She is a um, was working on another rare disease at the NIH for, for many years and is very well respected in the field of NF. She also has a daughter with Rett syndrome and uh, came to us when Dr. Steve Kaminsky retired. I'm going to let her, in her own words, give her some updates of what we're doing at rettsyndrome.org in the field of our broader research agenda. Hello. I'm Dominique Kishard, the Chief Science Officer at RedSyndrome.org. I'm delighted to be able to share with you what we are working on and how we are continuing to drive the science forward for your loved ones with Rett Syndrome. Over the last 20 years, there's been so much progress from the identification of MECP2 as a gene responsible for Rett Syndrome to the start of the Natural History Study funded by the National Institutes of Health to the first clinical trial and the landscape has drastically changed over the last 20 years. So where are we today? Today, we have a phase three clinical trial. This is the last study needed 
before a company can go to the FDA to request approval of a drug, which would mean a drug would be available in the pharmacy or a hospital with a prescription. This is the first time in the history of Rett syndrome that we are able to talk about a day where we might be able to go to the pharmacy to pick up a prescription for Rett syndrome, not just for the many medical issues that Rett syndrome causes, but for Rett syndrome. We also have a pharma-sponsored phase two trial that just completed enrollment for which we are waiting on results, as well as two additional non-pharma-sponsored trials. Many of you have heard that there are also two gene therapy trials in development with an anticipated start time in the next one to two years. Now, I do wanna put a caveat on this timeline because neither of these companies have yet gone to the FDA specifically asking permission for the clinical trial that they want to start, which means there may be changes to this timeline. There may be more things they need to do before the FDA provides permission for them to initiate a clinical trial. Uh, but there is hope now that in the next one to two years, um, one or two of these gene therapy companies will be able to bring a clinical trial for Rett syndrome. Not only has RettSyndrome.org invested in clinical trial development, but we've also changed the landscape by investing in the research that can impact your family now. Today, we have our first ever primary care guidelines. These guidelines are available on our website and available in the medical literature. These guidelines are so that the doctor or team of doctors that take care of your sons and daughters know the standard of care of a child or adult living with Rett syndrome to ensure optimal clinical care. Today, we have the first ever communication guidelines so that your son or daughter's team can develop a strong functional communication plan that allows your son or daughter to have a level of independence in how they interact with the world. So often, the world happens to our children but a functional communication plan puts them in the driver's seat and lets them interact with the wor their world in a much more meaningful way. We believe that transformative or curative therapies are in the future. We believe that there will be a day when we don't recognize Rett syndrome as we do today because the treatments have changed the course of the disorder. We're committed to funding innovation to bring solutions forward and to have the delivery mechanisms, clinical trial readiness in place to make these innovations a reality. In Rett syndrome, we as a community are very fortunate to have multiple groups investing in Rett syndrome biomedical research. This research is extraordinarily expensive, costing billions of dollars to make lab discoveries and actually bring them all the way through to the clinic. But Rett syndrome is now on the map. U.S. government agencies, such as the NIH and the Department of Defense, as well as international governments, are funding research in Rett syndrome. Our colleagues at Rett syndrome Research Trust are funding work in Rett syndrome. Local Rett syndrome associations are also funding work in Rett syndrome. We need all of it, yet it's still not enough. I work closely with government agencies advocating for more funding in areas that will specifically benefit Rett syndrome. This year, I was invited to be a member of an NIH strategic plan working group that was charged with identifying key priorities for the National Institutes of Neurologic Disorders and Stroke to fund over the next five years. I had a seat at the table advocating for NIH to fund the type of work that Rett syndrome science needs to get us to the next level. I advocate on your behalf so our dollars can go further. But as I said, we need all of the funding and each funding group has its own philosophies and priorities. So I'm here to share RedSyndrome.org's priorities. We invest in the solutions from the lab science that makes breakthrough discoveries to the clinic network that is needed to deliver those breakthrough discoveries. Both parts are critical to our joint mission of treatments and curative therapies for Rett syndrome. I am unwavering in my mission to excel in both areas. So how are we doing that? We're continuously scanning the neuroscience, brain, 
drug development, cell and gene therapy industries to identify science to fund. Science generated from known Rett syndrome researchers and science from other fields that stands to benefit Rett syndrome. Science that will move the field forward toward our mission of bringing treatments to your sons and daughters. We formed a scientific advisory board and this group of world-renowned experts is guiding us in this plan. We are clear in our vision for funding science that happens in the labs. All strategies must be tied to identifying new treatment options, be it a therapy that allows your son or daughter to have an improved quality of life or a therapy that has the potential to be transformative for your son or daughter in the future. This includes discoveries that identify a path to a treatment and ways to identify prospective drugs in those pathways to testing those promising candidates in the animal models. We are here to de-risk the process so pharma and biotech will continue to engage and find Rett syndrome an attractive disorder to invest in. A not so unknown fact is that pharmaceutical companies want to invest in disorders where they will win. And clinical trial readiness is a huge part of that equation. So what are the components of clinical trial readiness? Clinical trial readiness means having a network of centers with enough expertise in the disorder to carry out a clinical trial and clinical research infrastructure to successfully conduct those clinical trials. Clinical trial readiness means having tools to measure success. In a clinical trial, outcome measures are biomarkers that indicate therapeutic improved how someone feels, functions, or survives. Clinical trial readiness means a patient community that is willing to participate in clinical trials. A good way to scare away pharmaceutical companies is to have clinical trials fail because not enough people enroll in the study and they have to close it down early. It's like sending a message to other pharmaceutical companies to run away because for pharma, time equals money. The longer it takes to enroll for their clinical trial, the more money it costs. So you, the patient community, are a vital part of clinical trial readiness. So what are we at RedSyndrome.org doing to support clinical trial readiness? For the clinic network, we have a newly formed medical advisory board, which really formalized an informal network of physicians that have been advising us. And this medical advisory board is consisting of leaders in the field. They are guiding us in the process of developing center of excellence designations for RET clinics meeting high standards we all want for the care of our loved ones. This group of centers of excellence will be ready to be the delivery mechanism of the great breakthroughs we are investing in. Next, those tools to measure the success, the outcome measures and the biomarkers. This will always be a work in progress. We do have tools today, but we need better tools. We're engaging researchers, pharmaceutical companies and biotech, the FDA, and families, all key stakeholders of the discussion. The tool used in the clinical trials will depend on what treatment is expected to do. And as we know, if you know one person with Rett syndrome, you only know one person with Rett syndrome. There's so much variability. And so the tool needs to be able to detect meaningful change through all this variability, which is no easy feat. But we are ready to tackle. And lastly, the community. I hope you have had a chance to get to know our RET Research Ready program. This tool is a natural strategic extension of our research investments. RET Research Ready is a program to educate you, a parent or a caregiver of a girl or boy with Red syndrome, so you feel empowered to make an educated, informed decision about whether participating in a clinical trial is right for you and your family. I was recently speaking with one of our RET clinic directors, introducing her to the RET Research Ready program. And she shared that this is one of the most powerful tools we could equip our families with. Vetted, accurate information about what clinical trials are, what it means to participate in clinical trials, and what to expect during and after a clinical trial. As well, it has a one-stop shop 
to see all of the clinical trials being conducted in the U.S., regardless of who is sponsoring the trial. This is a tool for all. And for those families who decide participating in a clinical trial is not for them, or families who have a son or daughter who's not eligible to participate in an active ongoing clinical trial, but they still want to contribute to the research, there are other research opportunities listed in the RET Research Ready Program that you can do from the comfort of your home. This includes surveys that researchers are conducting or studies that are conducted through telehealth visits. Everyone can contribute to the research if they want. Importantly, we are getting our community RET Research Ready. At RETSyndrome.org, we're committed to growing clinical trial readiness in our entire community so that we are an attractive disorder to pharma and biotech, so that those breakthrough discoveries that are being made in the lab can turn into success stories. I hope that over the last 10 minutes, you've taken a trip with me that leaves you inspired and excited about the future in Rett Syndrome. And you know what RettSyndrome.org is doing to move the needle. We are all in this together. We all do our small part to make a big difference. And together, as a unified community, we will advance towards a world without Rett Syndrome. Thank you. I hope that you enjoyed that talk from Dr. Dominique Pichard and that you learned a lot about what is going on in the field of Red Syndrome, the projects that are ongoing despite the summer's uh, disruptions. A lot of work has been underway. Dr. Pichard and team have been working day and night to continue progress. And we appreciate every family that has been a trailblazer participating in clinical trials, is considering clinical trials, and um, has spent some time on our website getting to know the My Research Ready Trial Finder. There are some other opportunities that you as families can participate in. If you go to the My Trial Finder, we also have surveys and questionnaires. So if you, participating in a clinical trial is not something that you're ready to uh, consider, or perhaps you don't reach the meet the enrollment criteria for any of the studies that are listed on the Trial Finder, or that Dr. Jukic is conducting at Montefiore, you can still participate in research through many of these surveys. And these QR codes can take you directly to them, or you can find them on the My Trial Finder. And we really encourage you to spend some time and consider participating in research. Again, we can invest as many dollars as we as we can. We can bring as many industry partners to the table. But unless you meet us there, that research won't advance. So um, thank you. Thank you for educating yourselves about those. Now, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit briefly about family empowerment materials. These are the things that we're producing that are in the here and now. Dr. Prashard talked about the communication guidelines. That was a team of researchers, um, families, worldwide, over 600 um, contributors to that document to help advance communication with your children. You can buy that on our website and you can buy that in a digital copy, copy or a print copy. And I think in these days where a lot of providers are getting to know our children only through uh, telehealth or virtual education, those communication guidelines can really accelerate. Um, the, they're getting to know the syndrome specific to your child while well, you work to get these providers to know who your child is. And I know that one day they'll be back to working with your kids in person. We have a digital library on RettSyndrome.org for over two years now. We have been doing monthly Rett Ed webcasts on various topics from epilepsy to movement disorders to communication disorders to puberty to different options for adulthood. All of those recordings are available on our digital library, and we encourage you to take a look at them. Today's town hall was not about Rett Syndrome 101, but um, rather to update you as to where we're at in our activities. 
However, if you go to our website, you can access the digital library and look at all of the topics that might be something that you're dealing with with your child right now and get some of the most expert opinions on those current topics, including orthopedics, scoliosis, breathing, autonomic dysfunction, and on and on and on. So please make yourselves um, aware that those are there and they are there at any time of need that you might have them and they are free of charge. Okay. Also, at the beginning of this pandemic, back in March and April, when we found ourselves suddenly asked to be at home and not go to school and go to therapies, we realized that we were stuck in our homes without our usual equipments, without our usual supports. And we did a series of Facebook Live events where we asked our therapists worldwide to do some live streams into families' homes to give advice on how to use our everyday equipment and our everyday um, environments to continue enriching our kids' lives, um, doing movement, doing communication, how to get into a pool and do therapy swimming um, to keep her active, to keep him moving. All of those recordings are available on our website and are relevant um, now and beyond. So if you're looking for those kinds of activities, um, please take a look at those. And I know that some of our families who allowed ourselves into their homes are on the webcast today. So I want to thank you again for being with us during what was a very stressful time and that um, what you shared with us at that time is still relevant and still accessible and um, will have a long shelf life beyond. We also are making periodic community updates available on our website published by Dr. Tim Banke, who's our RettSyndrome.org medical advisor. But this advice and those updates relevant, how COVID specifically is relevant to our families with Rett syndrome are all written under the advice of the network that Dr. Pichard talked about and Dr. Jukic um, advised as well. So that is an evolving picture and we will keep you updated as uh, this goes on. But as Dr. Jukic said, with the vaccine coming, there is light at the end of this tunnel. We do have monthly Rett Ed webcasts that um, not only are part of our digital library, but we'll be upcoming and our next one is this very next week on Tuesday, December 8th. We're gonna bring you a RET Ed webcast on what do they see vision and RET syndrome. We talk about this a lot with CDCAL5 deficiency disorder. Um, and it is something that has been, I think, understudied and under discussed in RET syndrome, although Dr. Drukic did talk about vision and RET syndrome and how that impacts sensory integration and um, use of eye gaze devices and alternative communication devices, uh, picture symbols and whatnot. So please uh, register, these are free and we will have our 2021 calendar published soon. So now I would like to invite um, Shirley Hurlbert, who is your RittSyndrome.org parent volunteer representative for the state of New York to bring her webcam on open her microphone and talk to us about some resources that are available right there in your state. I know we have families with us who are in surrounding states as well, um, but she's gonna focus on New York and maybe talk about um, some other resources if you live outside of the state of New York. So Shirley, welcome. Thank you so much for all the volunteerism that you do. You have a child with Rett syndrome, you have a busy life, you're a full-time working mom, and yet you still find time to support all of those in our community, and we're so grateful for you. So take it away. Thanks, Paige. Thank you everyone for taking the time to join today. Um, again, my name is Shirley Hurlbert. I um, am a licensed master of social work, but most importantly, I am a mom to Kayla, um, who is 19. And I'm also a mom to Kinley, my little ginger, who is turning 12. Um, I, Paige, am I able to click links on the slide? You're not, but if you'd like me to copy and paste them over, because I'm running your slides, if you'd like me to take you oh, to the okay. internet, I'm happy to. Uh, yeah, soon. Um, so I also work for the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities. I um, am a forensic social worker, but prior to that, 
I was a Medicaid service coordinator for 10 years, working with individuals who have a developmental disability and their families. So this is, you know, some a field that I've been a part of for many years. And I want to make sure that people in the state of New York, and I know that in the other surrounding states, there are similar resources. Um, maybe I think in uh, New Jersey, managed care, but they should still have the um, resources that you can connect for a waiver program. Um, and the first uh, link is our New York State Rett Syndrome.org Facebook page. And it's page if you, I don't know if you want to click on that real quick. Yeah, let me give that a try, see if it'll come up. Okay. I shortened the link, the link, so. Let's see, there we go. Okay. Can you see the Facebook page? Oh, Shirley, I think we lost your audio. Oh, Shirley, we can't hear you. I'm sorry. Nope. Oh gosh, I hope going into the internet didn't take away. Let me go and close that. Oh, there you go, I think. Can you hear me now? We sure can. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, sometimes there's just okay. a little while. Delay. Okay, I had to. All right, let's see if I go back on my. Yep, now we've lost you. Try again. That's okay. I'll use my um, computer mic. Okay, so every state should have a Facebook page that is um, that you can locate on the our Rett syndrome page um, through rettsyndrome.org. Um, so as I was talking about services for New York State families, um, and I'm afraid to have you touch that <laughs> link, but I'm, I should be okay now because I'm on my computer audio. Um, so in the state of New York, Office for People with Developmental Disabilities offers many services. Um, we actually, Kayla has been, was the, one of the first children in our region to be a part of self-direction she was about four years five years old when we started the program and it basically uh, allows me to hire our own staff have the, the um, her hours uh, that she needs staffing work around her schedule and her needs so if she's out sick from school i she has some aides that will come in and help um, she also has an overnight nurse due to her feeding tube and her seizures because I do work full time. Um, so on that's just one of the services. Through the Office of Developmental Dis uh, Office for People with Developmental Disabilities, there's also as the children start to get older, there's what we call community hab. They can take um, they can the agencies find staff, take them out into the community if you're comfortable with that work on skills and life goals, um, you know, whether that's just interacting in their typical community, shopping, maybe Kayla's um, staff takes her to buy Christmas presents for family. And she just really likes to get out in the community because she's social, as most of our girls are. Um, there's also, if you have a young child and, Again, this is, sorry that it's mostly focused for New York State, but that's really the state that I am most familiar with. Um, there are a program that, you know, right away you could access is called Respite or Family Support Services. And that will assist with providing 
so respite reimbursement, maybe if there's specialized equipment, small pieces like under, usually about under 1200 a year um, can be purchased. We, oh, okay. You still have audio, right, Katie? Yes, we can I saw a little you. note from Katie, I wasn't sure. Okay. Um, so respite services, we all know how exhausting it is sometimes to be a full-time caregiver. And, you know, our daughters also, and sons, want to break from us too. At least I know Kayla does. She gets kind of annoyed having to spend all of her time with me. So the respite services are one of the easiest to access, especially if you have a family member that you would like to pay to watch your child or some of the agencies do have staff that they do hire. Um, another really necessary service in our lives is the assistive technology and the environmental modification. So we have used this service a great deal. Um, Kayla had a full bathroom modification last year to allow her to have a roll-in wheelchair shower. And it was a quite expensive undertaking that we would have never been able to afford ourselves, but it's made her much safer in the bathroom so that she's not you know, slipping and falling or whatever. Um, and they also at the same time installed chair climbers. So, cause Kayla is ambulatory, um, but so they um, installed chair cli stair climbers and she can sit in the, chair and we just electronically take her up the stairs so we're not lifting her or um, when she's having like some rough days and she's unable to walk very well she's a little bit safer going up the stairs that way um the assistive technology piece that has allowed us in fact this week we received a new uh convey stroller to be able to take her out into the community and so they, that is a, another resource that is able to assist with equipment that Medicaid wouldn't necessarily cover. And in our situation, they would not cover another wheelchair because she had just received a wheelchair to transport um, into the school. So we had to access two different funding streams. Um, it talks about crisis services here. Generally, those are services that are directed more towards um, some of the individuals that access services who are more on the behavioral side, um, sometimes duly diagnosed, and um, the parents, you know, need to access some crisis services. Maybe they need housing. Um, we typically don't support individuals in our group homes under the age of 18. Um, on very rare circumstances, are we able to do that? Um, okay, Paige, uh, I think we can go back. Thank you. So the link for the resources for New York State, that will take us to the RettSyndrome.org webpage, hopefully if I did it right. I tested my links, so. That's okay. What I can do is I'll navigate to there if you wanna talk about it a little bit and then that way everyone can see how we navigate from our homepage if that works. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so on here you will find all types of resources that are in our state and every other state that has um, been able to contribute some information. And you can see that Paige is able to access it fairly easily. Um, state resources, national resources, um, but I think you know the state resources will help. It has links to, I believe, the Medicaid site the um, our Office for People with Developmental Disabilities site. And I'm really hoping that people are connected with OPWDD because that is what you're gonna really need going forward in your journey because of the fact that there are so many things that come up 
in our lives that we never thought that maybe we would need help with. And then we're in the thick of things and we really do. Um, Paige just went by a dream factory that's similar to make a wish. Um, yep. So they're a wish granting organization, not just limited to life threatening. So I think some of our girls and boys have qualified. It talks about um, Medicaid waiver, special education, we um, and conservatorship. So um, guardianship, I know that there's a lot of questions about guardianship and in certain areas of the state, I know that people um, have some higher court fees that are associated with it. We're fortunate in our county, at least, that I think our filing fees are like $20, but I do know in other counties, it's quite expensive to um, have the guardianship process started. We actually originally had looked for an attorney. We ended up not needing an attorney. We were able to go through the local nursing company, they had someone that was knowledgeable with guardianship. So if your child does receive some nursing, you might want to find out if they can assist with that. Some of the ARCs also in our state can assist with guardianship and they bill family support service money. So it shouldn't be an out of pocket cost for the family. And let's see, transitioning to adult services. You know, I wish I could explain more about that, um, but we are in the thick of that right now. Like I said, Kayla is 19, she'll be 20 in April. We have one more year of school. We are thankful that we have self-direction because that means that I can create a program based around what her needs are. Um, otherwise, she would probably go to a full-time day program. And because I do work, because I was a service coordinator for so many years, I know that a day program is not going to work for her. It's a site-based setting, sometimes out, um, a day help without walls in the community, but it doesn't allow the flexibility that she would need. So, you know, but there are options and sometimes a day program is what's best for, that works for individuals. But the transition piece is, I think it's, it's tough. It's manageable and it's doable. You just have to, again, continue to be a strong advocate for your child, which I know all of you are. And it's not an easy journey, but you know, just remember we're in it together. There are resources, there's contacts through not only the website, I'm available. I've included my email address, my phone number, in fact, I know I have some messages to return from some people that have reached out. I do my best to kind of keep up with all of that. Um, I'm not going to go over the all about me, but on the Rett Syndrome website, there is a recommendation that some of the communication ideas are to create an all about me album. We did this when Kayla was very young and shared it with not only her teachers, but her little classmates. So we probably did this up till third or fourth grade when she was more integrated. And then she has now is in a BOCES program, which is a self-contained classroom at a high school outside of our district. But it's a, a wonderful program. It, there's about eight children in there who are very high needs. And she has a wonderful team and she loves going there. So we're okay with it being self-contained. And especially during COVID right now, she is able to go to school five days a week. Um, because of the small setting. So you might want to take a look at that, the All About Me. Um, I did find it very helpful when she was younger. And just a reminder that, as you all know, our girls can be consistently inconsistent. I hear this at every IEP meeting. I remind the staff at every IEP meeting that, yes, she takes steps forward. Yes, she takes steps back. But she also knows when they believe in her and when they don't. And I know which staff she and therapists that she bonds with because of how they believe in her. And I know which ones are not her favorite because she can pick up on how they're treating her. So the progress that she makes is based upon her ability for the day, but also who she's interacting with. 
Um, and I'm okay with her being consistently inconsistent because that's her voice. And the final thing is I am looking for a state rep that could assist downstate. So I am upstate, central New York, but, and I know people are like, oh, they, you know, everyone thinks of New York City, but nope, I live up where we actually do have cows, um, not near me, but we're not too far from farmland. Um, but I need someone in the city, in the boroughs, to be able to help families down that way. I received lots of calls and emails from families that are in New York City area, Long Island, and I am just not familiar with the services downstate. And I would love to have someone partner with me and you know do this journey of helping families you know together. So if you're interested, please reach out to Paige or um Katie Bush, anybody at the RettSyndrome.org office, and hopefully we can connect and you know do some good work together. Again, thank you all for joining. Um, I, I know what you're doing is not easy, but you're not alone. Thanks, Paige. Oh, thank you, Shirley. Thank you for sharing your family with us. Thank you for sharing your story. And thank you for sharing your professional background and your uh, tremendous resources. You are an incredible resource to all families. And we are so grateful for you. And I hope that somebody in the more metro area of New York City will reach out and offer to co-rep with you. Um, it is not highly paid work. It is volunteerism, but the rewards are great. And I'll have to say that is how I started in the Rett Syndrome community myself in the state of California was as a state rep. And the rewards that I got from helping other families really was very therapeutic on my own journey. So. Um, uh, I, I hope you feel the same. Thank you, and thanks for being with us on a Saturday. Okay, everyone, so we are um, at our 90-minute mark, but we have some questions. So if I can invite Dr. Jukic to come back on webcam, uh, we sent her a list of questions, and I see everybody staying on. So. Um, Dr. Jukic, if you're still there, I don't see your webcam. Yes. Do you see me? I don't. I see myself. Can you hear me? Great. There you are. Okay. Okay. So basically, I received a group. I want to be efficient because we are running late. So there are questions. I grouped questions. Uh, first, there are many about several questions about adults, like do I have to bring my adult daughter to a red clinic? Uh, what are the benefits of being a red specialist? Are there any studies uh, being done for, uh, for those for adults? So yes, studies are done. Uh, one of the trephinidate studies included patients up to 40, an ANAVEC study in which I do not participate, which I know that Boston Children's Hospital participates, they also include, pay, uh, include participants who are 40 or even they went up to 45 years of age. So at different time we have different studies and yes, adults participate. So should, you, uh, should your daughter see a red specialist? Uh, since you registered for this seminar, uh, it is clear that you want to learn. And as I said, uh, the patient does better if the family does better. If you understand uh, what happens inside your daughter's brain, uh, uh, you will be able to help her better. And if you see one of the red doctors one-to-one, -one, uh, your your personal questions, we all have different priorities, will be answered. In addition, uh, you, uh, do you know how, what is your daughter's bone turnover? 
you probably do not because there's some risk. We don't, we, uh, they, uh, the, we do not see all problems, but we know that bone, bone is not forming and absorbing at a normal rate. So we have something which is called health care maintenance. We test every year so we can prevent fractures, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, in terms of the medications, we use many medications which are off-label, which are uh, approved for some other medications, but are effective in uh, treating of some of red syndromes. Uh, uh, then there is basically a benefit of networking, because each of us in large centers, we have families of similar age, similar situation, educational background, uh, zip code, so we can facilitate that. And basically, uh, just being on the uh, being uh, involved in the this is a very dynamic field. Maybe for the last ten years, the, the scientific advances are huge, and you will be able to be updated on the regular basis. So, um, I think that all patients should use now of a possibility if they don't live close to the red center uh, use a, a possibility of uh, having at least televisits with one of the red specialists if uh, uh, you can ask us and we will let you know whether we are permitted to do it for your state hopefully some of us uh, will uh, one very short question my daughter has recently been diagnosed what do i do make the appointment there is nothing else I can say, it will be better for her. Especially if she's young, the world is open for her. Uh, question, what is the latest in sleep research for girls with red syndrome? It seems that many of our girls have trouble sleeping. Yes, uh, there is, I'm not aware there is ongoing research now, but there are, many, there are publications in 2019 and 2020, and to summarize, uh, basically, uh, there are publications to do clinical reports by parents, which came from Australia, and they have large population and do surveys, questionnaires online. So, and there is a recent study which came from France, which actually uh, describes a sleep study results. So, the conclusion is that uh, most people say it is about 80% of uh, patients with red syndrome have sleep problems. Some studies say 60, but not later than, not less than 60. Uh, basically, there are two types of problems. One is problem with sleep maintenance, meaning you cannot stay asleep. And the other is problem with sleep onset, you cannot fall asleep. Uh, people oftentimes use melatonin. Melatonin is going to help you fall asleep, but it's not going to help you stay asleep. And staying asleep, sleep maintenance is the major problem in our population. So, uh, poly, this sleep study results showed that the, most of the girls, 80% of them have abnormal sleep architecture. We know that sleep comes in cycles, 90 minutes, one cycle, and the next cycle, and all stages are abnormal, uh, but especially REM sleep is the most disturbed. Um, we worry about obstructive sleep apnea, but that actually is a very rare uh, finding in red, unless if you have it, then probably you have big tonsils and adenoids and you have to uh, deal with that. Uh, sleep is important because our memory is consolidated in sleep. Uh, some hormones are uh, secreted during sleep. A growth factor is secreted when we sleep. And of course, we need to maintain daily awareness. So there are many reasons to have a good sleep. In terms of medications, uh, there are groups of medications which use, but people, when people compare, usually the most effective is trazodone, which is this SSRI. And I personally use it the most. Uh, so that is about, this next question is about, um, uh, about oral contraceptive pills for irregular periods. So on our team, we have the endocrinologist and basically uh, uh, that is individual. So I'm not going to tell you give this or that medication for your uh, uh, daughter, but 
the, the, the general advice is that oral contraceptive pills are good for them uh, because hygiene is usually difficult, especially if they have hip contractures, or spasticity, it can be uncomfortable, but pure progesterone pills are not healthy. The most healthiest approach is to use oral contraceptive pills, which have combination of different hormones and to have periods, to let them have periods every three months. Like, I'm not going to publicly say names of the medications. I can email you directly which medications our endocrinologist prescribes, but I think it is really individual. You should see the endocrinologist. If you live in the in the in New York State, you can email us and we will connect you with our doctor and you can do a video or in-person visit. Um, uh, so, when I spoke about sleep, I'm sorry, I forgot. Basically, the studies uh, show that the most effective is actually sleep hygiene, and there are four, uh, four uh, things which you have to uh, pay attention to. The environment, temperature, noise, uh, darkness. So, that is important. Quiet, dark, and warm. Uh, always go to sleep at the same time, and then exercise uh, and, and, and don't eat, like, just before you go to sleep. Um, next question. Many questions are related to COVID, so let me answer that. COVID, basically, people ask uh, what to do. How, do do I, we have any experience with our patients having COVID? And the answer is yes, and we will elaborate. The second, um, the one parent said, uh, we can keep checking temperature often. Uh, what else can we do to check whether she has it or not? And the third, will vaccine be admit be uh, uh, because patients have seizures? We, are we going to be able to administer uh, vaccines when they become available? So. Uh, with, I do have personal experience, three of my patients had COVID, two were teenagers who were ambulatory, one is with control seizures, one is with really, really uh, such severe seizures that I'm sending her to second opinion to Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. We do that. We talk to each other, our us that doctors in help to each other. To uh, try to help each other. So, and the third is a young, uh, a, a, five or seven years old. So they all did very well. They didn't have severe disease. Uh, they all got it from their parents. And basically, uh, the one who had severe seizures, this her seizures got better. That is the best uh, 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 period in terms of seizures. We have anecdotal evidence that children, sometimes when they have fever, they talk, and we know that fever uh, uh, changes levels of noradrenaline, some chemical in the brain. So that is a possible explanation, or it was just a coincidence. Uh, I was lucky, I do hear in the broader community that COVID uh, affects uh, our response of our patients to COVID matches the response of general population. Some are not sick, some do get very sick. Uh, there are a few who were in intensive care unit and came out, and there are uh, a few very small number who actually uh, did, uh, who, who did not make it. Uh, so, uh, people who had it, they said uh, people who had it they say you feel like uh, 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 you were hit by a truck so you were we you were you don't have energy and uh, if you measure temperature up and you you actually even do not have I think to measure temperature offer because you will see if she's sick or he if they uh, behave normally, even if they have the COVID, it will be a light disease. So I don't think there is anything else you have to do. You have to watch for those super spreaders and your own contacts. And then about the vaccine, I am not a vaccine expert, and we still do not have uh, full information of these vaccines which are coming, but they're all, we know that we do not immunize children with seizures with live vaccines. These are not going to be live, they're going to be genetics, they're going to, uh, uh, to uh, attack uh, genetic material of the virus. With that said, I do believe that immunizations will be uh, safe, uh, uh, but we still have to wait and see. Um, 
So let me just see whether we have some other questions. Uh, yes, so there are questions, there is a group of questions about I'm struggling with the five week period of lack of interest in food, not eating, uh, taking applesauce, energy level not great, fatigues easily. Uh, her weight has been the same for three years, poor interest in food. So uh, we know that the growth issues are common. Uh, we also, uh, for this patient who has a five new period of lack of interest in food, that is something which is very concerning. And unfortunately, this is a complicated disease. So I wish I could tell you what is happening over the, uh, like, <laughs> Uh, uh, remotely, I think you need to be exam examined hands on by have a blood test taken by pediatrician, by gastroenterologist, by your neurologist. So that is something I would address very seriously. There may be uh, something else going on. I wouldn't let it go past uh, uh, five weeks. Uh, so basically, I think that these are the most important questions. They were all good. Um, there are patients who participate in trials who are asking about occupational therapy in, in, um, uh, in central Pennsylvania, which I really don't know, but I think you have a great resource with the clinic in Philadelphia, and maybe you, tr you should reach out to them. So it was a pleasure to talk to you, and thank you, Paige, for organizing this. Oh, gosh. Thank you, dear. Dear Sasha, I'm glad to be on a first name basis with you. I, I consider it an honor. And um, thank you for all of your wonderful work. Please keep yourself safe. Keep yourself well. Thank you. This so, is this so my help. What's that? I hope we see each other soon and we see everybody in person soon. Yes. I know, I'm so grateful for this technology to at least allow us, afford us an opportunity to be together virtually. We will be together in person again. I promise that. Until then, please be well. Please follow all of the guidelines. Um, we do have a variable reaction uh, in our children with Rett syndrome. As Sasha said, most are doing well. Many are testing positive and are completely asymptomatic. And then we do have kids who are on the other extreme who are getting very ill. So just like um, you would do for yourself, protect your child. And um, if you can, I know not everybody has the chance to allow others into your home right now or uh, to help you, but you have to stay replenished. Please take care of yourself. The best thing you can do. I had a parent who told me once, I am my child's best DME. And that, that is uh, kind of funny to think about, but you are. You are her best advocate, you're her best resource. If you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of her. So as a mom to all of the parents on the call today, please take care of yourselves and rely on this expert team with Dr. Jukic, with the other RET centers, with all of the resources on our website to take care of your children. And we will be together again soon. This was just for us to get together on a Saturday, hear some updates and know that we are continuing our work on your behalf. So I hope you sleep a little bit better at night and we'll talk to you all again soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care.